the past few years we've met lots of people in our travels, both John and I and a few of the other people involved with the group in our quest to find out more information about the existence of thylacines both on the mainland and in Tasmania. Okay, so hands up, who thinks they've seen a thylacine in this audience? A third a quarter of you think you've seen something? On a personal level for myself, I've met lots of really interesting people and had the privilege of being invited to lots of different places to um, experience not only local stories and diverse parts of Australia, but also I've met with a few of the indigenous folks in Australia as well that have wanted to share their knowledge and their culture with us. And uh, one of those people is Marie Mankara. Um, Marie is a established and published author and Indigenous writer. She's worked for ATSIC and uh, Indigenous health programs in the Northern Territory. And her traditional homeland is in Western Arnhem Land. There's a croc lying on the mud over there. Yeah, I saw it. Uh, she's now doing her PhD on the Yalk Yalk which is something I'll let her tell you about, which is part of her culture and her totem for her uh, skin group in Western Arnhem Land, which is the Rambadaka people, I believe. Rambadanya. Rambadanya. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to introduce you to Marie. So welcome to, to Goa, Marie. Hi. <laughs> so thank you for inviting me up here and giving me the privilege of going out to country and meeting family and and learning a bit more about um, your your culture and your family's knowledge on country and and the associated plants and animals in the region. Oh, this is my second visit up here with you. As you know, you invited me up here last year, and we met with your cousin Mandy out in in uh, Kakadu, and she had some interesting information about old Stripey, aka the thylacine or thylacine if you're uh, up to speed with your Could Latin. Correct, Latin, yes. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about yourself in regards to country and culture and how your journey's been sort of getting to where you are in your life now. Uh, yeah, look, I was born on country. I was one of the very, oh, one of the very last to be born. And my two grandmothers delivered me on the banks of the Minery River. And they, I was introduced into the world in the traditional ways and, um, but yeah, unfortunately I was the wrong colour, so I was taken away and given to a white family to bring up because I wasn't black enough. But anyway, I was fortunate enough to find my family and get home again and then reconnect myself with all the stuff that um, has been there for like tens and tens of thousands of years. So yeah, I was, I was very, very, very lucky. And within that space, so there's been lots of interesting discussions with family about what's out there and what isn't you know because it's another world there it's not like you know the western world where everything you know comes from the media or someone said this or whatever you know we've got this ancient ancient knowledge that we've carried all the way through this for all this time for tens and tens of thousands of years and that's still very very strong and we still rely on that that knowledge and we pass it on to our children i've passed it on to my children as well not as much as what i could if i'd grown up here but yeah, and within that knowledge, of course, is Jugu, the thylacine, thylacine. <laughs> Can you spell that for me, please, just for the audience? We don't have spelling. We don't have those. It's just the word is Jugu. Jugu. But Jugu, Jugu, yeah. Jugu. Jugu is thylacine, yeah. Okay. Mm. I was privileged enough for you to share some information with me regarding um, thylacine art sites in Arnhem Land and Kakadu. Yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the art? There's some well-known sites like say Ubu and that's that site there where there's a thylacine 20 metres up on the rock face um, that's about three and a half thousand years old and my uncle Jacob Nangle was the custodian for Ubu and um, yeah he explained to me that to get up there and paint that they made scaffolding and the reason why that painting is still really clear after three and a half thousand years is because that ochre was mixed with blood and that blood just sort of stained the rock. And between Ubu and Manangrida there are at least 13 sites that 
I know of that my family have told me about where the thylacine um, is is depicted in the rock art. They, they, it's only in the escarpment. It's nowhere else. There's rocky sort of outcrops in the lower in the lower parts, but it's only in the escarpment that you find this rock art, which made me sort of come to the conclusion that maybe that's where their place is. And um, despite what the scientists say about oh the dingo killed them out, the dingo's only been here for five thousand years, etc. Um, I don't believe that. My family don't believe that. And looking at sea level rise and um, and when the islands across the top end got cut off, they were cut off around seven, nearly seven and a half thousand years ago, and the dingo was on those on the islands, and um, they didn't all come over on the boats or in canoes with people. And when the when the sea rose, people were there, they were stuck, and that was the, the water surrounded them, and they couldn't leave, and that's how they ended up on those places. So the dingoes have sort of occupied the plains country, and the jugu has lived in the escarpment, and that's where they're still living, as far as you know, some of my family are concerned. They're still up there. And, um, and this is like, they have this symbiotic relationship, and Sometimes they, you know, they sort of like their places they're hunting and that they'll cross, but they have um, their own ecosystem. They have their own places where they hunt, live, you know, have their dens and that, and um, and they they live in harmony with each other. So, in regards to that particular landscape, that type of country, um, your family traditionally was from the. Uh, escarpment country so they were known as the stone people yeah we were the stone people that's what we were known as and yeah we were the only ones that lived in the escarpment and we had knowledge of them and the old people had them as pets they had thylacine as pets this will be a bit of a controversial subject for a lot of academics out there because oh, they you know they they have a little bit of trouble with first-hand knowledge that's not coming out of literature i suppose and it's it's oral um, knowledge. It's it's a history and it's a family kinship that passes on this knowledge and these these stories through through the lineage of generations. I think it was your cousin Mandy out at Kakadu who was talking about her mother's knowledge of of them having as pets. Yes, yep, that's right. And um, unfortunately, for I, I don't mean to be sort of like politically incorrect here, but if a white person doesn't have discover that knowledge then it doesn't exist as far as they're concerned and yes it was Mandy's um, her family they have um, they they spoke of having them as pets and my family although they live at outstations at Manigrida and our outstations are on the edge of the escarpment um, yeah they their knowledge is different to what I think they're in more they're more prevalent around that Kakadu region because there's a lot more water there's flood plains you know so there's a lot more things for them to hunt, where it's a little bit drier over the other way. But there's also things that my family don't want to say because they don't want other people to know about. We just keep that to us. Yeah, and that's the sort of um, aspects of culture that you know we as non-Indigenous Australians need to respect and understand that we're not entitled to know everything, I suppose. Oh, God, no. That's our knowledge. We give what we want to give. Um, now, there is a painting that I've seen of um, rock art and it depicts what appears to be an Aboriginal hunter with a thylacine right alongside that particular hunter um, and I suppose that really kind of confirms what you're saying is it was it was actually a companion rather than something that they were hunting. They were companions, they didn't hunt them. What, you know, you, we, don't eat, we don't eat predators, yeah. we do not eat anything that predates on another animal. And they're lovely creatures by all accounts, you know, from what I've heard and from the stories I've heard, they were really lovely pets to have. They were really, you know, they were loyal. They're like, the, you know, we've had dingoes too that have been in our family and, um, you know, as pets. And, yeah, the thylacine were apparently really, really great pets to have. They, were, they weren't vicious or anything. Now, right not that long ago, you rang me up all excited to tell me that you'd been to Tasmania. Mm. And there was a bit of information that you had from there that oh, sort of backs yes. up what you're saying. Yes. So what, what were you doing down in Tassie, Marie? Well, in Tassie, I was there for an Australia Council um, workshop. Uh, but 
there within the group of people were two people, two groups of people from Tasmania, the, other, the, like the local indigenous people. And one woman said to me, have a look at the photos, have a look at the photos in the museum because you will see them in indigenous people, the old people in their canoes and what you're looking at there, not dingoes, because they've never ever had dingoes in Tasmania, they are thylacines, they've got in their canoes that they're cruising around. So there is actually photographic, photographic evidence, evidence to support that they had them as companion animals. Yes, absolutely. And they're in the museum and I'm not sure how, what sort of access people would have to them, but th they have that access and I've, you know, I've spoken to her about it and seen if, um, you know, if I could ever go and see and she said, yeah, of course, you know, but I'm not sure how you go about doing that. But yeah, they had them in their canoes. So, I mean, if you've got photographs of them in their canoes, that's, that's pretty, pretty strong, significant. pretty strong evidence. Dr. Bob Paddle's book, um, The Last Tasmanian Tiger. Yeah, he also mentions in there about some of the early settlers in Tasmania that took on young thylacine joeys as pets as well. And apparently they were quite adaptable to being, you know, within a kept environment rather than being roaming free. Yeah. And there's one particular story where um, the pioneer person that had it as a pet mentions how you know, if someone he always knew if someone was coming because about 20 minutes before they'd arrive, the, the the juvenile thylacine that they had as a pet would get very restless. So their sense of smell and hearing was quite astounding. We don't really have a lot of um, stories to say that they ever really attacked humans. Um, there's one story of um, David Flea, I think his name was, that went to film Benjamin, who was the last one in captivity and he was in the enclosure with Benjamin when he turned his back and went out. I think Benjamin nipped him on the bum and just gave him a little reminder that he wasn't happy being in a, in oh, a cage, I suppose. Oh, he in a cage for he knew he was going to die there. Poor um, and there was another story that was in Australian Post, Australasian Post years ago that I saw of probably 1981, I think it would have been, um, and a fella had, in Tasmania had grabbed one by the tail as it jumped his fence because he was trying to catch it to prove that they were still existing. Um, and um, it turned around and bit half of his thumb off. Um, and he was standing there, I remember it quite clearly, a black and white photo of this guy standing there with half a thumb. And he claimed to have had it bitten off by a thylacine at the time. So, well, he um, serves him right. Poor thing, having its tail pulled. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, there's plenty of supporting evidence to say that, you know, as a predator, they're quite you know, ferocious on their prey, but there's not a lot of evidence to say that they were actually that um, aggressive towards humans. Well, that one was obviously acting in self-defence, you know, having its tail pulled. Yeah. Now, in, in I just want to go back onto some of that dingo stuff. Now, mm. with your degree that you did at university, what was it exactly that you were studying? Which one? This Solid one or the pump. last one? <laughs> <laughs> You've done two degrees. Well, yeah, well I'm in the process. Uh, <laughs> well, more specifically, I think you mentioned that you were um, studying the history of your people. Oh, yes, the migration and the sort of like language and land and the people, yeah. Now, some of the people out there are going to want to argue your point in regarding to the length of time that dingoes have been in Australia. Yes. So could you just give the listeners a little bit more of your evidence that you um, research to back up your claim that dingoes have been here for a lot longer than 5,000 years? Okay, well, I was trying to work out when the Tiwi Islands were separated from the mainland. So I contacted a person by the name of Elko Rowling at ANU, Australian National University, and he uh, works in conjunction with Southampton University in England. And he is the world sea level expert. And so, um, yeah, well, it was just fortuitous that I rang his number and he picked up the phone and I said, hey, I'm doing this study, this research, and I'd like to, um, yeah, have you got any information at sea level rise? Because this is what I want to do. So yeah, he gave me this information and I could work out to almost the year, the exact year where the Tiwi Islands were cut off from the mainland. But um, the people and the animals that were there then would have been slowly, slowly cut off from the mainland. It wasn't sort of like an overnight thing, but 
they would have slowly, as t they would have been there. It's not like they thought, oh my gosh, you know, the goodness, there's an island over there. Let's go and and um, go and check it out. No, they were there, and the seas rose about uh, around them, and um, so the dingoes were, were living there, and they haven't always been our pets. People seem to think the dingoes sort of like are just attached to indigenous people, you know, like we have our you know, domestic pets in Western society. Well, no, they were already wild. And, well, they were already animals that had sort of made their way into the wild. And um, all across the top end, all the islands have dingoes on them. They have their own little sort of, um, their own populations. And the one on the Tibi Islands is has evolved so it even looks slightly different and slightly smaller to the mainland one. But So they've been isolated for at least 7,200 years and scientists say that you know they arrived here 5,000 years ago with some some travellers from India. Um, a lot of things just don't support that and the fact that they would have been around for at least two and a half thousand years before that. And also there was in Arnhem Land, there's this burial that we have in Western Arnhem Land. There's um, a dingo that had been buried with all the full honours. You know, he was the red ochre and wrapped in paper bark and put into this into a crevice in the rock. And this one's like about five thousand years old, five or six thousand years old. Um, it's been around for a long time, a lot longer than what people say it has been. And um, I don't know how you prove that, but you know, there's rock art that you know show these things, I guess, but. Yeah, no, they've been they've been around for a lot longer because when the TV, when the islands across the top end were cut off from the mainland, that was seven seven thousand two hundred odd years ago, and they were living on those islands when those islands were cut off. And I don't think there was ever this clash between them. They just found the the dingo came. They were introduced, like you know. But they found. But their they niche. found their little niche, and they sort of like the thylacine already had its place established. They didn't get driven out. They didn't get driven out at all. Um, do you know of many sightings up in the territory that you can share with us? I don't have personal sightings, I only know family anecdotal sort of stuff about, yeah, we, we had them as pets, we did this, we did that. But I think one thing that sort of like explains the reason why they're up in that country too is, that, is sea level rise once again. You know, 6,000 years ago the sea up here was another about 5 metres, 6 metres higher than what it is now. and. If they'd been living here forever, they would have, that's that's where they've established themselves. They didn't have any need to go down to this other space. When the sea res, receded and, you know, this other, they didn't need to go down there. They knew, they had the, everything. So they would the have. sea level rises in itself would have been enough to push them further up into the escarpment if they were on that. If they were down there, they would have gone up there, but they, they've already always been up there. And when you see them, I mean, you know, their build, you know, the way they are, their whole, yeah, they're more suited to that sort of country. I couldn't imagine them sort of like running around in the plains like the dingoes. They're just not the same build. Um, they're not that same animal. Do you think up here the government are listening more to traditional landholders regarding fire management, land management? Are there more and more indigenous ranges now than there was? Like, is it is it getting better in regards to you know what's the best practice for managing these indigenous lands that? You know, traditional owners have. Um, do you think the white fellas are getting it, or and and paying more attention to indigenous knowledges? Are we seeing a a progress, a progress regarding this stuff, or are we sort of stagnating or regressing with with um, you know recognition of it, traditional knowledge on land management and stuff? Oh, I think there's still a long road to go. I think there's a long way, but at least there's change. There has been some change. And, you know, one of the first changes and one of the most wonderful changes when my brother, Dean Yababok, became the senior ranger of West Arnhem Land, or of Arnhem Land, that, that proper, you know. He became the senior ranger. It wasn't some white fellow that came from down south and got his degree down there, and yeah, got him, you know, coming in saying, OK, now this is what you do in Arnhem Land, when, you know, Dean and my family have known forever how you deal with that land. So Dean became the senior ranger and... Um, yeah, it was great, you know, so that all of a sudden the fire management stuff changed because he's saying, no, no, we've got to do this the other way, you know, my father, our uncles, all that, you know, the way they did it. We're not going to just like, okay, we plan on this day, we'll all come in, we'll just fucking bloody raise the ground, you know, the, the everything to the ground. He, he did things the way that we used to do them, and, and the way you do them is you do them slowly, you plan, 
you look at whatever's happening around, okay, you know, what are the animals doing? What are the plants doing at the moment? What's the sky doing? Taking in that full picture. You could take it all in. Full you, could, picture. you could look at all that. You just don't, okay, on this date, we just go out there and we burn. You don't do it. And now they've, um, they're using Western technology to help. It's just so good to be able to be given the, the right to make decisions on your own land. That was a long time coming. But to be able to give, give them the right, say, no, no, we want to do it this way. And people saying, oh, right, then, you know, you know, it's your place. Never happened once, never ever happened, but now it is. And it's not only that we're sort of like doing this for tourism. Yeah, we're doing this because we love that part of the world. This is where we're born. This is where, our, you know, we have ancestors, you know, that have died and been buried there. This is our land. And we want that just to be, you know, right. And not only that, you know, they're, our little bit then contributes to that, you know, the greater, the greater good. Because we all live on this planet together. We're all brothers and sisters on this planet. I don't care what people say, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not white, European or anything like that, but you know, they're still my brothers and sisters in the end. And we want to make this a good place to live. This has got to be a good place to live. We're doing our bit as much as we can in Arnhem Land. That's fantastic. Mm. It's something to be really proud of and I'm, mm. I'm flattered and privileged to be invited to come out here and for you to share some of that with me. and. Um, I think there's a little bit of a myth getting around through a lot of popular sort of European culture in Australia that you know indigenous people don't really want to share anything with with white people but uh, I haven't found that myself it's been nothing but welcome and people want to open up they want to share they want to tell you their stories they don't want their stories to die you know, with with them, you know. I mean, some stuff is secret and that's got to be respected because that's cultural um, practice for, for men's business or women's business and things like that. Mm. And you have to understand those protocols and boundaries. But overall, um, from my experience, people have been extremely welcoming and engaging and, and supportive and, and happy. I mean, yeah. to see people thriving in, in those communities and really wanting to to share that history and that knowledge and that country with other people. It's a beautiful place to live in, but you know, it's um, be shared with true and genuine people. That's the only people that will be allowed willingly to go in there, true, genuine, nice people. I look forward to going out there again. Yeah, yeah, so do I. It's always lovely to go home, always. Yeah. And it was such a, such a pleasure to take you there. Your eyes, you were like a little kid, just like, oh my God, look at this, oh wow, oh wow, look at that. <laughs> no, it was so nice. Um, it was such a pleasure, an absolute pleasure to take you there.